Good evening ladies and gentlemen. This is tutorial number 11 of my series of tutorials on N-Audio and C-Sharp. So I'm actually going to continue expanding upon tutorial number 10 by customizing one of the N-Audio controls, which was that wave viewer that we experimented with. So this tutorial is going to be a little bit strange because we're actually not going to do much audio at all. It's actually going to be playing around GDI Plus and some of the stuff that uh, we do with controls in C-Sharp. So Hopefully that's still interesting. Anyways, as always, you can grab the tutorials online at www.giawa.com slash tutorials, and you can grab the latest version of the N-Audio class library from naudio.codeplex.com, and N-Audio is a class library for interfacing with all sorts of audio stuff in your computer, so it is pretty cool. You can check out the previous and uh, future tutorials as well. Okay, so one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into the source code here and I'm going to grab the source code for the Wave Viewer. So I'm just going to go to the latest change set and browse the source code. And the source code I'm looking for is in the N-Audio namespace under GUI and it's called Wave Viewer. So I'm just going to take this whole thing, uh, shift click down to the bottom, control C to copy it. And I'm going to keep that in my copy, copy buffer while I go to Visual Studio. And I'll create a new Windows Forms project. I'm going to call it Tutorial 11. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the N-Audio DLL as a reference to my project. There we go. And the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new item and I'm going to call it custom wave viewer.cs. And in here I'm just going to do a control A and paste. And the first thing I'm going to do in this file is change the namespace to tutorial 11 so I don't have to do any funky namespace stuff. All right. Now I promised I was going to try and zoom in because my resolution combination and encoding settings were making it difficult for YouTube to display the text very well. So I'm hoping that running at 1280 by 720 and zooming in a bit is going to help with reading this text. Right then, so I'm going to do a few things in this form just to set it up. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to name it Tutorial 11. And just like we did in the previous tutorial, I'm going to drop a menu strip which is not in here, it's actually in here. Give it a file menu and open wave. Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to compile and run this and then close it right away. And the reason I did that was so that wave viewer shows up here. And I actually didn't want to call it wave viewer, I was going to call it custom wave viewer. So bear with me while I go and change that. My apologies. I'm going to change it to custom wave viewer and we'll have to change the constructor as well. Let's run that code so that it populates our toolbox. And now we can go and drag and drop that in there. And I'll go into the properties and I'm just going to dock it to fill the entire screen. All right, so all we have left to do is write our open wave file method. Put a little filter on it. Right, I need to zoom in on this one as well because it doesn't maintain the settings. That looks pretty decent. If they don't click OK, then we're going to exit out of this method. And the last thing to do is go into my custom wave viewer and associate a wave stream with it. And use the file path there. So let's run this and make sure that we get what we expect. Open wave, there it is. So you can see that it doesn't really fit to the screen properly and it's using some uh, black lines there. So we're going to go and start to customize this control. And the, customization, uh, the customizations I'm going to do are perhaps a little bit strange, but they're things I find interesting. And I think they're going to make this control a lot more useful. Now the first thing I was lamenting on last tutorial was that I couldn't change the color of the pen. So that's the first thing I'm going to change here. I'm going to add a property for setting the pen color, and I'm also going to add a property for setting the pen width. And the way I'm going to apply this pen is by finding the onPaint method. So you can see that this control is overriding the onPaint method, and it's then going and using e.graphics.drawline 
and using a black pen with that to actually draw the lines. So we need to replace this black pen with a new pen. And I can do that in here by using a using statement. And putting this entire thing in my using block and then using this line pen here as my replacement to this black pen. Now the reason I used a using statement is because all of the underlying GDI objects are actually in unmanaged memory space. Almost all the GDI objects, including things like bitmaps and pens, etc., are actually created by GDI, which is in unmanaged space, and then GDI plus is just a wrapper for GDI. So the using block ensures that the dispose method is called on this pen and one or two pens floating around in un unmanaged space probably isn't too big of a deal, but if we're doing this draw method thousands of times, it could become a problem. So let's just make sure we dispose of it properly. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set some defaults for my pen color. So up here in the constructor, I'm just going to say this pen color, this pen color is equal to Dodger Blue because that's one of my favorite colors in here. And I'll just set the width to default of one. So let's run the program and make sure that we've actually done something. And we have, there we go, it's drawing with a different color. So the next thing I thought would be pretty useful to do was to actually fit the entire thing to my window. So uh, depending on the width and height of my control, I'd like to have it dynamically and correctly resize the number of samples per pixel so that it can display the entire waveform on the screen. So I'm going to create a method called fit to screen, which accomplishes just that. The first thing I'm going to do is exit if I don't have a wave stream. And then I'm going to go and calculate how many samples are in my wave stream. And the way I can do that is by asking the wave stream's length in bytes and dividing that by the bytes per sample, which has been calculated elsewhere in this control. And I'll set the start position to zero because we want to align it to the start of the track and then I'll set the samples per pixel to the number of samples divided by the width of this control, which is in pixels. So we have number of samples per pixel. And the way I'll test this is by setting my wave stream in form1.cs, and then I'm going to call, go and call fit to screen. So when I run this code, I should open the wave file, and lo and behold, it fits the entire WAV file to the screen. So you can see there's nothing trailing off the end anymore, which is kind of cool. All right, now something else I really like to do is have a way to move through the WAV data. So one of the ways to do that is to use your mouse to actually zoom in on the data. So I'm going to go and write a zoom method, which takes a left sample and a right sample sets the start position to the left sample. And you have to remember that the start position is in bytes, so you have to multiply by bytes per sample. And then I'm going to set the samples per pixel to the right sample minus the left sample, which is the total number of samples on my screen, divided by the width, which is the total number of pixels. So we get samples per pixel. All right, so now we have to go and start writing the methods for handling our mouse events. And one of the neat things you can do is you can draw lines where the where you click the mouse and then release the mouse. But this can cause a lot of problems because you have an issue with what's called destructive drawing. So if you just draw a black line over your control and then try to erase that line, you've destroyed the data underneath of it. So you have to really redraw the entire control. Now, there are some of you who may have used programming languages in the past, or you might have used GDI or anything like that, where you had Zor brush functionality. And Zor is pretty neat because if you Zor a number uh, twice in a row, you'll get your original number back. So by using the Zor brush, you could have non-destructive drawing. You just draw the line once, it appears as a line. You draw it a second time, the same line, in the same place, and it will erase that line and restore your original drawing, which is pretty cool. Unfortunately, if you comb through GDI+, Plus, there is no Zor functionality. For whatever reason, they chose not to allow you to interface with the Zor brush from C Sharp. But there is a method called draw reversible line, which is in the control paint class, which is probably not too well known about. So we're going to use draw reversible line, and there's also draw reversible frame, and uh, that way we can emulate the Zora brush. So I'm going to have a little method here that wraps this functionality, which is called draw vertical line, and I just need an X position. 
And this is going to use Control Paint, draw a reversible line. Now Control Paint operates in screen space, so I have to convert my point to screen space. So use point to screen. I'll pass the x value in zero. And then I'll need to use point to screen, x value, and the height of my control. And I'm just going to use the black line for this. So that's all I need to do. Okay, so the next step is to override all of the mouse methods. So I'll need on mouse down. I'll also need on mouse move. And lastly, I'll need on mouse up. And when I'm using these three methods, there's also three variables I'll need. The first two, which are points, are the current mouse position as I'm moving the mouse, and then also the original starting position. So I need the starting position so that I can go back and erase the first line that I drew. And I need the current mouse position so that I can keep updating the new line as I draw it. And finally, I'm going to have a Boolean here called mouse drag, which is false by default, which will be true when I'm actually dragging my mouse. So on a mouse down event, I'm going to do this if the user is pressing the left mouse button. I'm going to set the starting position to the location of the mouse. And I'm going to set my mouse position to an invalid point. And the reason I do this is because I don't want my first line to be erased. So by setting it to an invalid point, I won't be able to erase my first line in my mouse move method. My mouse drag is now true. And I'm going to draw a vertical line at this position. Okay, so we might as well just check this out and make sure that everything's working as we'd expect. So we can see that I'll open a WAV file, and when I first go to draw a line, click, release, so you can see it's drawn the line, but it's not actually erasing it at the end. So I'm going to do that in my on mouse up method. So my on mouse up method, if the mouse was being dragged, and the button that's been released is the left mouse button, I'm going to set mouse drag to false, and I'm going to draw a vertical line at the start position. So this is drawing my vertical line again in the start position, and it should erase it just like a Zora brush. So let's try it out. I click and drag. When I release, the line disappears, and there's no funny destroyed data in there at all. So it seems like it worked perfectly. So the next step is to get the line that moves with your mouse. So that's not too bad either. That's going to happen in the on mouse move call. So an on mouse move, if the mouse is being dragged, I'm going to draw a vertical line at my current mouse position. And if I have a valid previous mouse position, I'm going to erase that line. And lastly, I'm going to set the new mouse position to the current position. All right, so let's try that out here. We'll see that I can open the wave file, click, and then as I drag, a second line is created. Then when I release the mouse button, I need to remember to destroy this final line here. So that will happen in the on mouse up. All right, so if I have a valid last position, so if my mouse did in fact move, then I'm going to erase that previous line. Put it like that, I've got dot .x. Okay, so this should now do everything. We can go and open it up, we can drag the lines, it erases them. Looks good. All right, so the last step is to actually zoom in on that area. So to do that, I have to call my zoom method, and I'll have to calculate my left sample and my right sample. So the left sample is simply the start position divided by the bytes per sample, plus however many samples per pixel I have, and then I need the leftmost line that I drew. So that's going to be the minimum value of start position and mouse position. And the right sample is identical except for that it uses the maximum position. So let's do this, bytes per sample. 
start position.x and most position.x. There we go. So the last step is called zoom with the left sample and the right sample. All right, we'll fire that up. And now I'm gonna zoom in. And it looks like it's working. But something interesting is going to happen here. I'll start zooming in and I'll get to a point where nothing gets drawn. Now this is an interesting little tidbit. What's happening is when I'm calling my zoom method, I'm updating both the start position and the samples per pixel. Well, what happens when samples gets very, very small and width stays quite large? The integer rounding will cause samples per pixel to be zero, so no samples will ever be drawn. So what we should do is require that samples per pixel has a minimum of one stored in it. So we can do that by using math.max1 with the value, and that will fix that issue we're seeing. You find that you'll be able to zoom in until eventually you get to one sample per pixel, and you'll never lose the data anymore. Now the last thing I want to do is I want to have a way to zoom back out. So I'm going to bind one of my mouse buttons to the fit to screen method. So I'll just put it here. If the button is my middle mouse button, then I'm going to fit this plot to the screen. So I'll go in here. I'll do a bit of zooming and looking around. And now I'll use my middle mouse button to pop back up and fit it to the screen. Now the last step I'm going to do is I'm going to fix this issue with it not resizing when I resize the window. So we can do that very easily by overriding the on resize method and just fit to screen every time this window resizes. All right, so we'll open it up and there we have it. So we've added quite a bit of functionality in here. We're now able to zoom in, fit to screen, uh, use these mouse reversible lines. So it's pretty interesting stuff. I think the control is a lot more powerful now, a lot more usable. And hopefully this provided some insight into how GDI Plus works and how .NET Forms sort of work. All right, so that's it for this tutorial. I hope you found it pretty interesting. It was definitely a little bit different than normal, but as always, it's going to be available on www.giawa.com slash tutorials. And I really hope my new resolution uh, video encoding and zooming in has helped you to see the text. If, uh, if this was a tutorial you found pretty interesting, let me know because I, I don't need to just stick with audio tutorials. It is, it is cool stuff, but I do really like doing things like video, DSP, processing, controls. I, I'm all over the map. So if this is something that interests you, let me know in the comments and we can do videos like this in the future. Maybe I'll branch it off and have two different paths I'm going down. So until then, uh, download the code, check it out, and as always, have fun coding.